Hello, Peter. Hi, Vimal. How are you? I'm good. Or should I say Namaste, Sasrikal, Salam Alaikum, Privyet, uh, Ola. How are you doing? Yeah, Any, anyone will do. Yeah, that's yeah. all. Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, here, I'm good. I'm good. I mean, you're, you're from Wolverhampton. Is, is, is that right? Am I or have I got that wrong? No, that's, that's bang on. Yeah, born and bred, born and bred Wolverhampton and lived here all my life. So. Great. So, look, I know who you are. So I'm going to ask you, like I normally do with most people, in the style of Silla Black, what's your name and where you're from? And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> All right. So, so my name is Peter Chand and um, I'm a full-time storyteller. So I'm only one of a handful of uh, full-time Indian storytellers uh, working in Britain today. So this is my 15th year, I think, as a storyteller. And I've been fortunate enough to not just tell stories and and, and share stories but also train people uh, all across Britain and also in I think 14 or 15 different countries as well so it's a great job I'm freelance I'm self-employed uh, but I get to meet some incredible people and also hear some incredible stories as well because as a as a teller obviously you have to be able to to articulate and to sort of um, share stories you know and vocalize but you have to just as importantly be able to listen and absorb stories as well so it's it's equally listening as, as speaking so in a nutshell that that it is that's what i do basically and work with many different diverse communities as well hearing their stories and also helping them to vocalize their stories as well because you know stories are that's what makes us that's that's, that's part of our whole our whole fiber you know what i mean so what, what got me. you what got you involved in storytelling i mean is it something that you kind of reminisce about you know when you was a young child where you know your parents may say oh better come and sit down here look there's a story to tell or there's an uncle and auntie who's telling you a story or because it's a big thing in the asian community you know it's, it's, i mean storytelling like of most communities is, is, is massive yeah it's 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 huge it's we never used to hear stories in the necessarily in the traditional sense of like folk stories or, or, or fairy stories you know it was more like sort of family stories histories and about relatives you know every family's got interesting stories about its background about its history um and I'd love to say that, that you know, they used to sit us on, on, on their laps and tell us fantastic Punjabi stories. That would that'd make a great story itself and, and very idyllic. But the truth is there were, there were immigrants, they were working, you know, 12, 15 hours a day. And so a lot of the time is we were sort of left to our own devices. And in a way, I think that was probably the best thing because we learned to use our imaginations, make up stories, do you know what I mean? And, and sort of... Uh, you know, I remember with my nephew, we, we were playing, you know, on, on top of the neighbor's shed uh, and, and pretending we were, we, were, we were in the Star Wars. You know, we hadn't seen the film, we were just in the clips. So we were making up the whole film ourselves, what we imagined it to be as, you know, seven, eight years old or whatever it was. <laughs> um, so, so we were always using our imagination. I, I, I got into story setting. I was always into poetry still am and always into sort of like creating stories and scripts and things like this, you know, short stories. You know, even when I was in secondary school the teachers never knew this because you know I was considered a bit of a, a bit of a naughty child which I was I suppose but still for my mates I'd write stories and then I'd record them on the tape put batteries in that little tape player and me and my mates would listen to the sort of scripts that I'd, I'd, I'd written and they'd either be laughing or they'd be scary stories so I was always into stories and then I was taken to a storytelling club sort of 20 years ago never knew what a storytelling club was never even knew they existed and I think most people wouldn't really, but there's probably, I think, 50 or 60 regular storytelling clubs that meet, obviously, in non-lockdown situations, once a month above a pub or, you know, in the back room of a pub or a community centre, where people just share stories. And it took, the, the, the person to, who to, took me was a friend of my, of my wife's, uh, my wife's, and it took him three years, Vimo. It took him three years to convince me that I should go to a storytelling club. And I thought, what the heck is storytelling? It's, you know, what is it? Like most people, even now, they either think it's for children or they think you're going to be sitting there with a book, you know, and reading. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever, you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's in itself really important. But when I finally did go, begrudgingly, from Wolverhampton up to this little, I think it was an 18th century inn in Much Wenlock, just on the edge. It was really, me being a Wolverhampton lad, it felt like, you know, the scene in... Um, you know, in American Werewolf in London, where they go onto the moors and there's, I think it's called the Slaughtered Lamb. Yeah. That's how I felt. I thought, what, what, what am I doing here? You know, I'm sure I could hear the sign swinging, but it wasn't, you know, just my imagination. And then I, we went into this old inn and there was like people in a circle 
and uh, then the MC kicked it off, and one person stood up and, and said, like, here's a, here's a Shropshire story, for example, and they told, like, a local folk story or legend. And I thought, okay, that was cool. That was just from memory, you know, that was not, it was not like a script as such. It was just, you know, and then the next person said, well, here's a story from across the border in Wales. And it was going around and each person it was going around to, and my, my mind, seriously, I can't explain to you. It was like, it was firing on all cylinders. It was just, I thought, this is brilliant. This is like, it's like acting, but it's not, it's not acting. It's like improvisation, but it's not improvisation. There's structure to it, you know, as such. And I just knew there and then that that's what I wanted to do. And from that night, I think it was just six years later that I gave up a full-time job. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So I, I tell stories now. So that's how I got, that's the long story of how I got into it. No, that's brilliant. Uh, before we just move on to the, the question that was connected to that was, um, who played the role of Darth Vader when you said you were doing Star, Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember my nephew because he's, he's a great storyteller now as well. And, and, and he, he, he did, Chewbacca because he's, he's got, he can do the sound effects, you know? And I just, it was, I just remember, I, I, I don't think either of us would Darth Vader because we hadn't seen the film. we just seen the adverts. So we, were, we were trying to be heroic in our own British Punjabi way, do you know what I mean? And On top of this old shed from a house next door that had been a, abandoned how many years ago, I don't know. So, uh, but it's, that's the thing. And I think we still get this now as well, Vimal, you know, we get people saying that children are stuck to a screen, they have no imagination. Uh, they can't concentrate, but I don't know. I think that's a load of nonsense, you know. I think you have to find the right ways to engage children. I mean, I, I can give you hundreds of examples, like many storytellers can, or practitioners who go into schools, you know, where you've been warned about a year five or a year six, or, you know, a particular pupil or whatever who are awful, you know, and, and or, you know, you beware of them or, you know, just be careful. And suddenly you go in and then you're telling them a story and straight away, like, not all of them, of course. I'm not saying that, you know, I have magical properties, but 99% of them are suddenly like, they're engrossed in the story in a way that, that they may not. And this is no disrespect to teachers or anything like that. But I know a lot of fantastic teachers. But I mean, especially the kids who don't engage in a, in a traditional way, in a linear way with sort of academia, if you like, suddenly their light bulb comes on because I was that kid as well, you know? I was that kid, I wasn't stupid. Uh, I, you know, I had imagination, but I, the structure of, of schooling was not necessarily the, the ideal fit for the way that I learned, you know, we know not, a lot more now about learning styles and different learning styles, which back in the day, in the 70s, we didn't, but you know, you see, uh, it's like I said, so many examples. Of... How, do you, how, how do you make that connection uh, w with young people? Um... So, I mean, for, for you, because I mean, that's, that's so important, you know, as you've said, you've gone into a year five and suddenly you've got these kids where you've been pre-warned, listen, they're not going to, they're not going to engage, they're, they're not going to be involved. How, how do you make that connection? For me, I think it's quite simple. I think it's A, have fun. So in school, you know, especially if, if you're a, a, a child who doesn't necessarily sort of excel in, you know, in academically in the way that we're tested by, you know, the way that we are ultra tested now our children are ultra tested um when you suddenly see somebody enjoying what they're doing it's it's not necessarily an assumption that you might make about the classroom that's a and secondly i think the most important thing is and this applies to children and adults is i think it's being honest you know kids are so sharp at, at noticing a blagger so they know if you're if you're if you're doing an act they know if you're sort of uh, not coming from a place that is not true or that is uh, that is maybe even slightly patronising because I did when I was a child. You know what I mean? I knew straight away if, if an adult was not being honest in what they were saying, or if they were just sort of feeding me a line. And kids are astute, so those two things: be honest and sort of and have fun with what you do. And also, if I'm sort of working, like say in in you know in, in a diverse area, sort of Manchester, Handsworth, somewhere like this, you have to also appreciate as well that a lot of the kids, if they're from particularly an Asian background they would not necessarily have seen an Indian man of my age acting silly in front of them. The only Indian people or South Asian people they would have seen, males, would have been in a, in a sort of disciplinary role or a sort of father figure role, if that makes sense. So to suddenly see this big hairy man sort of telling stories and getting into the characters and one second acting as a mouse and next a second telling them about a stupid man who thought the world was going to fall in on his head, you know, it's, it's really quite, it's really liberating. And I think that's another thing as well is about when you're telling stories. Do, Every do you storyteller think it, who 
Sorry, carry on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, do you think it's important to kind of make that connection where you kind of give the children a license as if to say, look, this, you can relate to this, where they, they pick it up for themselves, not that you're telling them that you can relate to it, they find out for themselves, wow, I, there's an Asian character's name in that particular story itself. Uh, you might mention the word as an example, aluparote, which means potato chapatis, and suddenly some of them going, wow, I use that as part of my particular language, and suddenly they've, they've got, they, they then feel like there's a license for them to suddenly yeah. share their stories. Do, do you think that's yeah, quite I'm important that you, especially when you do go into diverse communities, that you do have people uh, from maybe similar backgrounds who might be telling the story or, 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 or from a, yeah, yeah, from a similar background. I think, it, I think it's really important. It's a, good, it's a good point you've raised as well because there's actually an, a real example I have of that when I was working in, a, in an assembly and I was telling a story, uh, it's called A Handful of Wheat that I heard from my brother. And I'm actually telling the story about the paratha in there and about the butter. And there was a kid at the front, like he was actually, he couldn't even keep himself quiet. It was brilliant. And I, I just saw him, I heard him first and I saw him and he was there going, Alu paratha. And he was really living it, do you know what I mean? But not only does it give them license to sort of those children who relate to that particular language or that particular culture, but also the other kids who are maybe from an Eastern European background or, you know, or maybe from an African background for them to say, you know, these, these, these two cultures can coexist, you know, the two languages can coexist because I'm a prime example of that as well. So when I go into uh, equally, my, a lot of my work is in sort of in, 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 in less diverse, in more monocultural uh, communities or schools, for example. So for them, it's, it's, it's a completely different thing because a lot of those children and staff probably have very little interaction, if any, with anybody who's not sort of, uh, you know, from their same background. So then it has a different purpose, if that makes sense. So you're telling the same stories, but those stories are flipped because then instead of like being in a school, say here in Wolverhampton, where most of the kids will know, say what a rugby is, you know, and the teachers will know, then you're in a, say somewhere in the, in, in the Cotswolds, you know, and then your, those stories serve a different purpose because then when you talk about rugby, you explain how a rugby is made. So those kids are then getting a different insight into a culture through the same stories, but just with a different onus on those stories, if that makes sense. So it's, it's, it's really interesting how their multi-purpose stories are, you know, uh, and, and, and how you can, you can adapt them by what you discuss. That's, it should be a discussion, definitely. I mean, that, that's so important that the way you've kind of talked about it, you know, about diversity. I mean, touching on that, is there lack of diversity, do you think, uh, within the arts itself? Yeah. Uh, what, what, what's, your, what's your kind of perspective? And, may, and maybe the reason why I'm kind of touching on that as well is it reminds me of a story where I was talking to this. Uh, he was an actor. Uh, he was also um, a facilitator and he was working in Bradford. He was, he was white, uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, brilliant actor. And uh, he said, look, I've been doing some storytelling stuff with Asian kids in Bradford. And I said, how did it go? And he went, oh, it didn't go down too great. And I said, why? He said, you know, I, I was there, I had a little teddy bear and I was talking about the story about this teddy bear. And I went, what was a teddy bear's name? And he, and he told me it was John or something or, or James or, you know, something like that. And I went, so who was the community you were speaking to? And he said, they were predominantly Asian. And I said, so where's the connection? And he went, I didn't think about it like that. And for me at that particular point itself, I suddenly thought, well, wait there, surely whoever employed him didn't really think about this in terms of how to make those particular connections. So. And, yeah, and so, so, you know, it's kind of coming back to that point of diversity, how important it is, you know, is, is there a lack of diversity? And, 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 there's, and the actor himself is absolutely brilliant. He's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, uh, and, and, and he acknowledged it and he went, you know what, Vimal, you've made a really good point. So I, I just wanted to share that with you and get your perspective on it. No, that's 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 a that's a, a, a perfect example, and and know that myself that I really. You you can the answer to that question is by looking around you. Is there diversity in storytelling? I, there's not. There's not diversity in the arts generally. You know, if people are honest, and in storytelling, it definitely doesn't reflect that, which is ironic, because our art form sort of uh, um, encompasses and 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 sort of and proclaims the whole no, notion of sort of. An international world and, and, and multicultural world you know what I mean that's the irony of it is that storytelling you know is is does encompass so many different traditions and yet the practitioners if you like are not representative of that in any shape or form or representative 
of of multicultural Britain in the 21st century, you know? Um, so somebody will contact me, you're talking about uh, bookers, you know, people who hire, uh, you know, practitioners, artists, creatives, you know? And so, yeah, they have a responsibility as well. So if somebody contacts me and say, Peter, you know, we're from a school in X, Y, and Z, for example, or, you know, we're in a theater and we want an hour worth of African storytelling. I could cobble together an hour of, of African stories, you know? do a bit of research, I've got books here. I could cobble it, but that's what it would be. It'd be cobbling together an hour's worth of storytelling on African tales. Or I could contact three other storytellers from either an Afro-Caribbean background or an African, Carib uh, an African background themselves who will do a hundred times better job than me, do you know what I mean? And that's, and that's the honesty that, that I was talking about earlier. And so I would rather for the sake of the art form that I proclaim to love and respect and gives me a living, share that work with people who are gonna do a better job to sort of advance that art form than me say, I'm taking the gig because at the same time, I'm not a saint, I'm still self-employed, but it is important because I'd hopefully um, wish the same kind of courtesy back when it came to somebody asking for Indian stories, you know? Uh, not to say that other people can't tell Indian stories, but. What I'm saying is, is if you're going to have a real meaningful connection and if you're going to then answer questions or be able to at least answer questions when children come back with them, going back to what I was saying about equilibrium between listening and telling, then you have to be equipped. And I think that's what it comes down to. It's being equipped with the, with the cultural sort of uh, knowledge and the background to be able to, to answer questions and to also come from a real honest place. So, yeah, we need more diversity. And that's something that I'm really very interested in and something that in the next sort of 10 years of my career that's what i want to do i want to i want to find those new storytellers those young storytellers not just from south asian backgrounds but from other diverse and working class backgrounds which is really important you know i'm very proud of being a working class british punjabi storyteller but i'm an anomaly in the storytelling world so do you think that's, as a, that's the truth so do you think as a storyteller you have to kind of have lived that culture as such to be able to uh, I was going to say to have that license to say, well, wait there, I've got a license to tell Asian stories because I'm from an Asian background. I've lived the culture. I've breathed the culture. I know what it's about. So from that perspective, uh, I should be allowed to tell those particular stories itself. Whereas say, say for me, as I suddenly said, well, you know what? I want to tell some uh, African stories. I've never really lived the culture, but I want to try and research it. Um, would that be seen as wrong? Each person's got their own gauge in what they think is right or wrong. And this is a conversation that's been going on in the storytelling community ever since I was involved in it, you know? I'd like to think that people are more aware of sort of, 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 of stories and the responsibilities they have for stories as well, do you know what I mean? But each person has to decide for him or herself what they think is their gauge. My gauge is a very simple gauge, and, I, and, and this is what I've used as, as long as I can remember, is if somebody wants me to tell a story, say, say, I don't know, say a Chinese story, for example, you know, or if I just decide that I want to throw a Chinese story into my repertoire, my simple gauge is this, is that I ask myself, would I be happy telling this story to a Chinese person face to face, you know, and would I be 100% confident that I was doing that story justice and that I wasn't just blagging it, going back to what I said earlier? Mm. You know, it wasn't just something that is, a, that is I've learned verbatim or, you know, learned to got an approximation of it and cobbled together. Or am I happy and confident that I can look them in the eye and tell them that story? That's a simple gauge for me. That's it. And if I feel that, no, I wouldn't feel comfortable, then I, w then I don't tell that story. I don't take that gig. I pass it on to somebody else who is more uh, equipped to tell that story and I, and I assume and that's, my, that's my that's my own gauge yeah and, and I assume from that perspective say if you were doing research and suddenly you came across somebody from a, a Chinese background and suddenly they were sharing their stories with you and said listen um, I want to tell you something you know this is what I experienced doing this and you suddenly delved into it even more and suddenly say there was a collection of stories would then that kind of because then suddenly you become part of a creative process where you're suddenly collating stories. Does that become a different thing? It becomes a different thing because A, they've been involved in it, but I would still ask the same question as well, is that how, how much am I giving them? Why, why, why am I not giving them? Or why aren't they not given, been given the opportunity to tell their stories themselves? That's, that's a real big question going back and connected to directly to the diversity issue as well, Vimal, is, is, is 
uh, I remember years ago, I think it was, uh, oh crikey, it was in, in the Netherlands I was working and somebody was telling me that, that the storyteller was telling me she was working, I think with some with Somalian refugees, you know, and that one of the storytellers were, were telling the stories in Somalian, you know, she said, and I I was then repeating them in Dutch, you know, and and people thought that I spoke Somalian, but I didn't. I just learnt it, you know, learnt the story. And I thought there's something I found really, and I can't still quite unpoint, pinpoint it, but something made me feel really uncomfortable about that Vimal, you know. So it was, it was, it goes back down to that honesty thing as well, you know. So she was happy for the people to think that she was a Somalian speaker because it advanced her career, made her feel more connected, whatever you want to call it, whatever people's personal driver is, I don't know, you know, but I found it really something uncomfortable about it because, you know, it's, it's, the, 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 it would have been better to find a Somalian translator who totally understood the language, the nuances of the language, the little sort of, in, you know, um, the intricacies of a language, because that, that would be completely different if they were then translating in Dutch, you know, and it's, I don't know, there's, there's, it's, do you think, it's a minefield. Do you, th yeah. do you think there's a lot of the, this thing of whereby once it becomes mainstream and everyone knows about that story, then you have kind of got a license. And maybe I'm, this is a terrible example. I'm trying to relate it to food, you know, where Lloyd Grossman suddenly comes out with the best recipe <laughs> for a for an Indian. Um, Lloyd, Lloyd Grossman's Alu, name for, mentioned in here. Nor have I. I don't know where, that, where I got that from. <laughs> you know, how to make the perfect alu gobi. And you're kind of going, whoa, wait there. <laughs> were you born in India? What's your what's your background in terms of doing that? You know, I, I, and, and and it's it's that kind of thing. Of I think when I first heard somebody who was non-Asian cooking Indian food, that for me was always a case of wait there, how how can you do this? You're you're not Indian. Do, do you understand all the intricacies of it? And then after a period of time, it was a case of well, wait there, everyone's making Indian food now, whether it's alu gobi, rajma, chane, or whatever, different types of Indian yeah. dishes. So you, you kind of accept, do, do you think there's an element of that whereby it's a case of, at the moment, those stories aren't heard from the communities, so hence the reason why there's a challenge there. That's a good question, but the communities uh, that I'm talking about, the South Asian communities, my father came here in the 1954, you know? So by now we should be hearing those stories. We should be hearing those stories all those years later. And secondly, I'd argue the difference between Lloyd Grossman's virtual alu gobi, you know. Uh, and <laughs> Sorry, Lloyd Grossman, is, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and a story is that a story is representative of, of, it has some, a story is so much more than just a story itself without elevating it to this sort of higher plane, which is out of reach, you know, which, which I don't like doing anyway. It still should be connected to the earth. But the thing is, is a story is, is also, it's folklore. A story is also uh, superstition. A folk story is also traditions, customs. A folk story, is, folk story is also language as well. So I would argue that when you're telling a story, you're doing a lot more than just conveying a set of words or principles or thoughts or ideas. You're actually, you're actually talking about a culture. And once again, this is what I was going, going back to earlier about having a, being connected to something and, and the honesty in that coming out when you're, when you're performing, whether that's to a, a child or to an adult. And and once again, it's, this is why a lot of storytellers say, oh, I only work with children. And I, and I say, why do you say, why do you, why do you perceive that with only, you know? Children are the, the, the hardest audience to work with because audience, adult audiences will listen to any old nonsense. And after an hour politely, they'll clap like this and say, thank you. And then just on the way back in the car, slag off the performance. Kill, children will slag off the performance in front of you. If you're, if you're awful, you'll know you're awful. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because kids will be walking or, you know, they'll have a finger up their nose so deep that it's making them go buzz-eyed. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, it's um, so, so it's simple. I think it's, it's about honesty and, 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 and just asking yourself, am I comfortable telling this story? If you are, go for it and, you know, and, and, and good luck to you. But I think that doesn't mean that we should not, we should not approach the subject of, of who tells stories and and also on the same subject of, of, of diversity who gets funded as well Vimal to tell stories which is a very important question as well I mean where's yeah. the money going to to who's telling whose stories you know I mean, is that something that um, is quite annoying for yourself in the sense of the the decision makers uh, who are who getting the the, the funds 
suddenly it's almost like they, they, they get X amount of money and it's a big pot of money to tell Asian stories and suddenly they'll go, hey Pete, can you just quickly come along and tell this story and go away now? Uh, it's like yeah, they're almost tick, I, I, tick, tick, tick to box. A hundred percent. I'll give you so many examples of this over the years. 20, 2017 was the, the year of UK Indian uh, celebration of culture, you know? And it was like 70 years since independence. And it was, uh, it was a whole year long worth of projects that were looking at the cultural connections and significance of the UK and India. I got booked many, many times. And, uh, and whenever I asked, what is it that you want me to do? Do you want me to do a workshop exploring the sort of spoken word? Do you want me to do a, a, a talk on uh, how I've gone to India, collected stories, translated them, made them suitable for Western audiences, you know, what I've kept in, what I've, you know, what, what, I, what I've edited out, all these kind of things. And I said, oh, no, 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 just, just, come and do, uh, just come and do an hour's worth of storytelling. That was fine. I turned up, I did a gig, I, I worked hard, hopefully connected with the audience. But then when afterwards I was checking on their websites, there was a whole feature of workshops connected around that one session. And that funding, that money, that sort of pot was shared out either amongst their own in-house you know, team or the, the practitioners of a non-South Asian background that they use anyway. So artists were coming in, textile or, or artists, artists were coming in that were doing work based around the springboard of that one session of Indian storytelling. So there was something I found very disingenuous about it, very dishonest about it, about using the, the, the UK India year of culture as a funding opportunity, but then that funding not being meaningful by employing any other, not, I'm not just talking about me doing more work, I'm talking about other South Asian practi practitioners, they're out there, you know they're out there, I know they're out there. And this is another thing as well, is that people will have a, a book of, of contacts and wherever they go, they'll take their contacts with them because they know they've worked with this, these particular artists, these particular sort of you know consultants or or practitioners and and they and they'll assume because they've worked with them and they've done they've, they've been happily engaged with each other that, that that's one size will fit all and so they'll just take their contacts with them wherever they go regardless of whatever context it is and that's what i find really quite disturbing and also quite sad as well you know that it's it, it should be looked upon as 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 as, as in, in, and people say that we look upon projects as individ, on an individual aspect but I don't always see that. And I, and how, do you, I think, how do you change? How do you change that? You, well, you change it by then starting your own company. That's that's the only way I can see it is by is by having your own sort of uh, control over these things and agency over your own work and the kind of work that you're doing. That's the only way to do it. That's the only way it's been done in the past. I think is by, and then it becomes a completely different thing. Then if you're a freelancer like me, then you're becoming an administrator. You're becoming a director. You're becoming a producer. There's a lot of different areas then you have to do as, as if you know you, you're not already multitasking as a freelance artist you have to do a lot more and 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 the rewards are supposed to a lot more as well but that's the only way that i can see because if we wait for crumbs any longer they they, they, they haven't been forthcoming thus far i can't see I can't see the slice getting any bigger, if I'm honest, without sounding too cynical. That's, that's what I feel. Do, do you think there should be uh, some kind of way of being able to challenge these organisations as well? Without, it, it's, a, it's a real difficult thing, isn't it, within the arts itself? When you're, when you're a practitioner, you know, I, I'm the same, I'm, I'm that practitioner whereby sometimes you really want to say something, but you think, gosh, if I say something here, I could be cutting my own throat, you know, because you're kind of... You, it's not easy being in the arts. I mean, you know yourself, you grab whatever you can try and get as well. And obviously once you get established like you, you, you can pick and choose. Um, so is it, is it a case of we, we need something whereby we can challenge it, but keeping anonymity uh, and also maybe even maybe challenging the, the, the arts council, the funders itself and kind of going, listen, did you really address that particular issue itself? You know, on, on what grounds have you, have you looked at it in, in terms of what your remit was and what you actually delivered? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure those organisations and those funders would say that, oh, we have a, a, very, a very stringent policy of, 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 of discourse as regards complaints and we have complaint, complaint procedures that are put in place, you know, that are very thorough. I'm sure all of them will say that, but it's... it's the structure itself, I think, is 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 
like I said earlier, I, I think I'm an anomaly. I think as a, as a working class British Punjabi, I think I'm an, I'm an anomaly, you know? And I can't be the only one out there that, that has creative aspirations that will look at the structures of funding and look at the art world itself and say, well, this is just not made for me. Do you know what I mean? So I, I often give this example when I'm doing talks or when I've had conversations with, 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 with other people in the creative field is, I, I give an example of, say if there was like, I don't know, say if there was a, say if there was a, an Eastern European guy who was, say his job was a, as a plumber, yeah? Just say his job was as a plumber. And he was working hard and he was making, say, 20, 25,000 pound a year, you know, grafting, proper grafting. And in his part time, say he was a charcoal, charcoal artist, you know, he did landscapes out of charcoal, really good. And one day somebody would just by accident see those and say, you know, you should, you should do this as a, as, as a living, you're brilliant. And the guy would say, well, well, well how, how, what do I have to do? And they says, well, oh, well, you have to put together a package. You have to put together a, a form to explain what your business plan is and what your intentions are. Okay, and, and, and what, what are the kind of things I have to say? We well, have to say the kind of things like who you want to reach and how many audiences you're going to reach and what your artistic statement is. And he says, well, I just know that I, I enjoy this and I've, I've got an eye for it since I was a kid. Okay, and then you've got to, you know, fill out this form and uh, it asks, you know, all these sort of different questions and, and all these rather abstract questions that are very art based, you know, and very sort of academic, almost bordering on. And then you apply, he says, and then I get the money. He says, no, no. And then it goes through a procedure where, you know, some people will get the money and some people won't get the money. Uh, and, and then you, you'll know if it's X amount within, within 12 weeks. Oh, so I've got to wait three months before I know. Says, yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm all right. I'm earning 20, 25 grand a year doing what I'm doing. Thanks ever so much. You know, because the whole structure is, have you ever looked at funding applications? Seriously, you know, I, I don't consider myself, uh, you know, somebody who's dense. I, I reckon I'm, I'm relatively bright. Do you know what I mean? I'm, uh, and I look at those forms and, and, and the questions they ask, and I think, who are these written for? And who are they written by? Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's the, whole, the whole structure I've, I really find is that's why I've applied for funding directly once in 15 years as a storyteller. And that was the year that I started. I just don't bother with it. I just, I just create work and I, and, I, and I sell it. That's, that's how I work and I have the freedom to do that. And I'm not saying that I haven't, been, I haven't benefited from funding. That would be dishonest because obviously people have applied in my, on my behalf to me, for me to be involved in a project. But myself directly, I've only done it once and I know people who do it every year, you know what I mean? And fair play to them, but... So you'd like to see the process kind of simpler? Not simpler, but also as well more more aim to encourage people who are not necessarily university educated white middle class practitioners who have an artistic statement you know what i mean they're, they're, they're people who have talent and skill and raw they know energy. how to play the, they know how to play the system yeah yeah do you know what i'm saying well yeah you said that but do you know what i mean but it's no, I, well, well, I, mean, like, I mean i mean i mean that in a way that they've got the education to know how to go about answering it's not questions just, yeah it's not just the education it's also the speak it's the speak art speak the you know it's like it's, I found this quite recently. I was working, I was working with some health professionals at, uh, at Wolverhampton University on using narrative arts, the storytelling um, sort of communication for talking to their patients, getting their patients' histories and stories, you know? Uh, and it was, they were great. They were normal, everyday folk. And I asked them about Nazruddin. Now, Nazruddin is, is like a Turkish teacher. In the storytelling world, everybody knows him. And I says, do you know Nazruddin the Hoja? And all of them said, no. And I thought that is brilliant because these guys are coming to it completely fresh, you know? So when they told stories, they were telling them as if they were telling them for the first time, which they were. So they didn't have this whole hist artistic or creative sort of baggage behind them. And, and, and there's something to be said for going in just pure and innocent with, with just a love for art or a love for, for storytelling or a love for communicating something do you know what i mean without it being framed necessarily within a sort of pseudo academic uh, very middle class kind of structure does that make sense you know it's 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 i think it's very limiting i think it's very limiting because you're never going to encourage people who have just got that that sort of that raw talent for something that that that, that just want to express themselves you know uh, so the funding tends to go to the same organizations the same individuals producing by and large the same kind of non-confrontational, very safe, and on the whole, twee work. You well, know? There's, where's yeah, innovation? I, where's innovation? 
I want to see you set up these companies and then people like me will be also coming up to you going, Pete, come on, let's do it. <laughs> let's change it. Um, so j just moving on in, in terms of what projects have you got coming up? Uh, I know that there's a, a regular yearly festival that you guys do. Uh, is, is that still going ahead? Because obviously with lockdown. Yeah, the physical festival is not going on. It's called Festival at the Edge, which uh, we're really proud of. It's the oldest storytelling festival in England. And this year would have been our 28th edition. Wow. And uh, we normally take place in Shropshire. So uh, it's, we would have been up at Clearbury Mortimer on our, on our new site this year, which is, which is a beautiful place. It's not after the 25th of July, is it? Sorry. <laughs> it, it, they've changed it. They've, they've just introduced the dates, haven't they? Is it the 25th of July, the government, where they've said you can... Yeah, they, they, it would have been before that anyway, but I think we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been applicable because we're marquee festivals, so this is for okay. outdoor festivals. So, okay. Um, so, but we're still having a virtual festival Vimmer, on the uh, 18th of July. And so if you go over onto our Facebook group, which is Festival at the Edge official group, um, that's where we're going to be running it for a whole day. And we've got some amazing storytellers, not just from Britain, but from other parts of the world as well. Uh, Norway, Singapore, places like this, and musicians. And also, it's, a, it's called Spirits Move Me. So it's a whole day of supernatural stories and songs, which is going to be brilliant. Starts at 10 a.m. in the morning, finishes at midnight. It's spoken storytelling. It's totally diverse from different backgrounds. And you'll hear some amazing blood curdling stories and songs it's free by donation only so if you're interested if you like a good yarn check it out and then hopefully if you enjoy it you can join us next year when we'll be back to a physical festival fingers toes crossed you know so that's that's coming up not this weekend the next weekend on the 18th of july uh, i've also started as well in the lockdown i've started archiving my stories as well Vimal, because like i mentioned earlier i've been collecting stories from india from family who moved from India, translating them into English. I've also obviously read a lot of Victorian collections as well of Indian stories, de fairified those stories and taken away the moralistic, uh, the moral, over, overtly moralizing aspects of them and brought back a bit of masala, as we say, you know. Uh, and I thought, I've got all these stories and nowhere are they documented because I'm a spoken storyteller, so I've not written them down anywhere. So I've started making an audio archive, you know. Uh, and every day I, re I record four or five of these stories. And my, uh, my aim is one day is when I do get more young, diverse storytellers coming in, they'll have a bank of stories that they can build on. They're not just Indian stories, but there's stories from around the world as well that I love. Um, but there'll be a bank of stories that they can listen to, you know, because like most storytellers, I, I absorb stories more when I listen as opposed to when I read them, you know. Is there any plans to launch a book? Well, maybe, but then this will be a good sort of uh, a, a good source of of of, of data because yeah. stories will already be there, and they'll be sort of I'm putting them in some sort of order under animal stories or wisdom stories or stories of death and love or romance. So, so there'll be some sort of structure to it anyway as well. So, if I do pop my clogs tomorrow, at least some of my stories will be there for people to listen to and share. And now, you are an amazing read. storyteller. I've heard you. Oh, bless so, your heart. You Thank know, you. You, you are brilliant. What well, I was. Uh, just before we finish, I was going to say, can, can, we hear, can we hear one of your stories? Have you got a short story that you can tell us? I've got a little one for you, yeah, if, if I may. And, and, and yeah. once again, I, this story has been doing this, the rounds for years and years. And then uh, there was a, a, a storyteller that I met called uh, Joel Ben Izzy. And he, um, he basically, I met him at a festival in Northern Ireland, the Belfast Miller, you know, he's a Jewish story, storyteller from the States. And he gave me a book and this story was in, in this book. And suddenly, because of the context of his book and his life story, it came alive for me. So I'm going to share this with you if I may. So um, he believes he came from India, but, you know, we're not 100% sure. So there was a man. And this man was searching for truth, you know. And he started off on his journey as a young man. And now his temples had turned grey. His back had become a bit stooped and still he hadn't found truth. He'd, so many false dawns, you know, he, he just wasn't successful. And now the young man who'd become an old man, he found himself in a village and he said, I'm looking for truth. And somebody said, listen, follow that path up into the mountains, there's a cave. And in that cave, you'll find truth, you know? And if you don't find it there, well, you won't find it anywhere. Then turn back and go back to your people and go back to your faith and go back to your, your place of birth, because that'll be the end of your journey. It's either there or nowhere. So finally he climbs up, he's trundling his way, zigzagging up to that mountain path and he comes to a cave and there's a dark cave, you know? And he sort of calls out into the darkness and he hears a bit of a shuffling. 
he hears footsteps and then truth approaches and truth she looks awful her hair's all falling out in clumps one of her eyes is bulged and her skin is all flaky and he says are you truth and she calls him inside and he sits down and he asks her all the questions he wants to ask you know what happens to a person when they die what happens to the soul is there anything such as a soul what is the future of mankind will mankind destroy itself all the questions he wanted to ask for a full year he asked her those questions and she answered them you know and each one was a, a huge revelation to him and after a year he put his hands together and he says thank you so much he says i'm really grateful he says for all this knowledge you don't know what it's what it means to me i can now die in peace with this knowledge is there anything that i can do for you and she looked at him and she said yes you know when you speak of me tell them i was beautiful <laughs> that's the story of the man searching for truth <laughs> brilliant brilliant i love that bit just that twist at the end <laughs> thank you so much peter i've, uh, I've really welcome. enjoyed your time uh, some real important subjects uh, obviously that we've discussed and topics um where, where can people find you if they want to know more yeah, peterchan.com is that is that i've made that yeah, up that's my website yeah oh is it oh gosh wow, 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 yeah yeah uh yeah uh, any, anywhere else you're on facebook you're on twitter yeah i'm on facebook i'm i'm on google i'm you know i'm a media tart darling i'm a media tart so you'll find me easily just put peter chan storyteller and you'll find me yeah. on facebook insta and places like that so. it, and not to confuse you with the peter chan counselor which i i typed your name <laughs> in and there, there is there is a counselor called peter chan is, is that yeah i know i know there's there's some sports coach as well somewhere in the, in the middle of nowhere that is also peter chan but peter chan storyteller tends to sort of put my put my put my mug up there you know it'll appear <laughs> well look peter thank you so much uh for joining me and uh, really welcome. appreciate thank it you. cheers mate thank, thank you care. thanks All thank you thank you thank you